Good morning, church. This is another beautiful day the Lord has made. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt him. We are coming off a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day yesterday. Thank you to those of you who came, to those who brought school supplies, to those of you who prayed, to those of you who worked. We didn't have 50 backpacks given away. We had, I think, 63. And these children came in, and we did not have that many children to come in, but we had some that, that got one for a cousin or got one for a sibling who was somewhere else. So our church has been a blessing to 63 children, and each child in their pack received a little card with information about our church. They also received the Book of Mark with uh, guidelines, and they also received a Sunday school invite. So we didn't do this to say, hey, now you have to come to our church. We did this to be a blessing, but seeds have been planted. The children enjoyed a wonderful hot dog lunch. It was truly an experience. It was an experience. <laughs> I will say that. It was wonderful, and we thank you all. Thank you all for making that possible. Let's look at our Spanish words. We can review. We will say, welcome. Bienvenido. Bienvenido. We say, how are you? Como estas? Como estas? And if, I, if somebody asks you, do you speak English? You could say yes. You say, si. Sí. <laughs> sí. I speak English. If they ask you if you speak Spanish, you can say, no. <laughs> we know that. We know how to say thank you. And you've heard that a lot in your life. So that should have been kind of easy. Gracias. Uh, yes. And drop the S if you want to. Gracias. Gracias. And if it's absolutely wonderful that you are so ever so thankful, it is muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. And when you take your bulletin home, you can do that and you can practice it and remember that you're learning to communicate with the most essential words. So this week, we're going to learn estoy bien. Estoy, I am, bien, good, or well, fine. Estoy bien. Estoy bien. And that means I'm fine, I'm good, I'm well. So if somebody, if you say, bienvenido, como estas? They might say, bien. Or, estoy bien. And then they will come back to you and say, como estas? And ask how you are. What do you do? Bien. Estoy bien. I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay? Or if you felt really, 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 really good, this is the day the Lord has made. Muy means very. So you would say, muy bien. And you might thank them for asking and say, muy bien, gracias. So now we can say hello, how are you, welcome, and when they ask you back, how are you, how do you feel, I'm going to ask, I'm going to say como estas, and you answer whether you're bien, estoy bien, or muy bien, okay, como estas, muy bien, I hear a lot of muy bien, I like that, muy bien, gracias, thank you for asking, okay. So, we are moving along. We are going to get a few more words. We want to be able to communicate with our neighbors that only speak Spanish or speak very little. And this will give us a start. And it's not too hard to learn one word a week, is it? One or two? Is that hard? 
Yeah, yeah, who said yeah? <laughs> okay, all right. Let us continue in worship as Daryl leads us. sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer up to you the sacrifice says the joy we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord and we offer up to you the sacrifices of
Amen. 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 Is that your prayer today? I need thee every hour. Not just some of the hours or some of the moments, but I need thee every hour. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And so that's where I believe we can draw close to the Lord when we acknowledge our total, complete dependence upon Him. And that's a good place to be. I think I have peace in my heart when I'm able to say that and to sing that. I need Thee every hour, Lord, and His peace comes and His grace uh, provides everything that I need. Well, um, I thought I saw Micah. He's hiding. Okay. Does he want to come? No, not today. Okay. We had some and they had to leave, so let's pray for them. But one, uh, we know this is being recorded, so we, uh, we're working on the potter and the clay story. And um, my f- I borrowed these from my four-year-old granddaughter. You ever played with Play-Doh with your granddaughter or grandsons? Uh, we have quite a time when I play. My, my granddaughter has quite a collection, and she has all of those little shapes, and we make different shapes out of the Play-Doh, but uh, I, uh, I grabbed some of these, borrowed them from her, and I uh, said I was going to use them today. So I got this orange one, and yeah, it's, I, got, I hope I got these in the order I want to talk about it. It's orange. And you roll it up, and it's very, very smooth. It's ready now to, well, it's ready to be created into something. And notice uh, the word play and dough together. Uh, When I think of Play-Doh and playing with Play-Doh with my granddaughter, I think of play as pleasure. I enjoy spending time with my granddaughter, and we have conversations. And uh, she tells me what she's doing with the Play-Doh, what she's creating, and then I'll create something, and she will be really honest with me. Four-year-olds are very honest. Grandpa, that's not very good. Um, But sometimes she says, Grandpa, that's really good. So that's good. So smooth. It's ready to go, okay? And uh, so the next one, let me make sure I got to get, get them in order here. No, that's the last one. This one here. Um, this one needs some help. In fact, I can't even get it out of the thing. Look at it. It's all rough and um, <laughs> I just noticed my dog was around when <laughs> Uh, so some dog hairs in this. Um, it's pretty rough. It needs some work, doesn't it? And um, so sometimes our life gets rough and it's got stuff in it and we need the Lord to come and do some work. So this one's gonna this one's gonna have some challenges, but I, I believe um, it, that um, it can be turned into something. Amen. Aren't you glad when we were rough and uh, we had a lot of stuff in our lives, the Lord, He, uh, he worked on us. So, um, so sometimes we're smooth, sometimes we're rough. And sometimes, and this one's my favorite, because this is a creation of my granddaughter. This has got different colors in it. Look at that. It's all mixed together. And it's smooth and it's beautiful. It, it almost looks like a, a planet Earth in some ways, right? Um, and uh, it's beautiful and it's got just the various colors in it and all of that. And I, when I think of uh, God's great work in my life, I'm glad, that, um, I'm glad that He can change us and transform us on the inside to the outside and and he makes us beautiful. When we talk about the potter and the clay today, there's a line in there. We're going to use it today about how the potter took it and shaped it into what pleased the potter, what gave pleasure to the potter. Aren't you glad that um, the Lord takes pleasure in you and me? 
So I say to all the boys and girls today, let God shape you and mold you. Let Him smooth you out and get rid of the rough and turn you into something beautiful that will bring honor and glory to His name. Lord, thank You today. Thank You for Plato that reminds us of how You take our lives and You shape us and You create and You recreate in us Your, your great pleasure. So may all the boys and girls realize that uh, you take pleasure in them. May all of us re be reminded today that you take pleasure in us as you do your good work in us. And we give you praise, honor, and glory for that good work. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen. So um, have fun playing with Play-Doh with your grandkids if you get a chance. It's a very fun thing, thing. So I've got to get these back to my granddaughter Franklin, so she can keep doing that. Amen. As we think about our time of giving this morning, I'm going to read you just a couple of verses from 1 Corinthians. I have a feeling sometimes when we think about the the book of 1 Corinthians, this first letter that Paul wrote to the church, we sometimes have a, a kind of negative uh, sense of this letter, and, and that's deserved in large part because he has some pretty tough things to say to the church. Uh, there were some folks there who, who needed some real change <laughs> in, in their lives, but he also had some very positive things to say to the church, especially as he began the letter. And he reminds them of how good God has been to them. He says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. That's a pretty good place to start. The grace that God has given us. We have to work for it. We can't really do anything to earn it or it wouldn't even be grace. So it reminds them it's, it's God's grace that he's given you. He says, for in him you have been enriched in every way. I suspect that's a moment where from time to time we just need to stop and think. You've been enriched in every way. Think of all the ways <laughs> in which God has blessed you. And enriched you. He reminds them of some of the things. He talks about all the gifts they had been given. He reminds them that God's strength is there for them. And that he has the capacity to keep them right through everything they're going to experience right to the very end. And after that he says, God who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. Well, His great gifts to us and His faithfulness to us should engender a similar response from us. When we give to Him, we should think of that same sense of generosity and faithfulness. And I thank you for your faithfulness in this, that you've been faithful in your support of the ministries of God's church. Let's continue to be faithful to Him and in the same spirit that Paul opened this letter, he says, I always give thanks to God for you. So let's give thanks. Lord, we are so grateful for that gift of grace that you have lavished on us. And in addition, so many other things. You've enriched us in every way. We're, we're sometimes forgetful of that, if we're honest. And we think of what we need and sometimes even what we want. But Lord, help us to remember all the ways in which you have already enriched us and that we have the opportunity in our faithfulness to enrich others. Even as we've done this past week, as people have given to the church and then the church has given out to the community, these ministries are supported by this simple act of giving that we now do in your name. Amen. Let's continue to worship 
as we sing this little chorus that says we are an offering. We lift our voices, we lift our hands, we lift our lives up to you. We are an offering, Lord, use our voices, Lord, use our hands, Lord, use our lives, they are yours. We are an offering, all that we have. Amen. Amen. What a great song to lead us to prayer time today. I give all my worship to you. I give all my problems to you. I give all my future to you. I give all my family to you. And when it's in the Lord's hands and he is the potter, we are the clay. He does his great work and um, we give him praise, honor and glory uh, what a privilege it is to come before His throne today and pray as the family of God. We're in His presence. He is our Father. We are His children. And so let's uh, call on the name of the Lord today. Um, we have in our bulletin today a, a prayer request and also a need. As many of you know, uh, Stephen and Jubilee Waldron are expecting their first child, a baby boy. And uh, there's been some complications, but the Lord is working, and the baby is growing, and the Lord is working out the details to get the help that they need. And one of those things happened uh, this week where they uh, are now in an Orlando hospital and will be there until the baby is born. And we have uh, an opportunity as the body of Christ, as the family of God, to come alongside uh, this family and support them with our love and our prayers and our giving. So we're going to 
uh, ask that as the Lord leads you, that you would bring cards in if you want to purchase gift cards, if you want to give monetary gifts. We want to support this family during this time. And we also have, we haven't said a lot about the In the Name of Jesus Compassion Fund, but if you would like to give through that uh, fund, uh, we will be sure to use uh, those offerings for this need. So let's uh, pray for this family, and I've, uh, there's a number of uh, needs on our prayer list that we want to bring before the throne today, and if you have a need in your heart, talk to Him today. He is your Father. You are one of His children, and just think about it today. You and I are the sons and daughters of God, and He loves us with an unconditional love, and He knows our hearts, He knows our needs today. So what a privilege it is to come into His presence in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank You that we can sing today from our hearts. And Lord, we thank You and we praise You for who You are and for all that you have done for us. Muy bien gracias, O oh Lord. Thank you that we can come to this time of prayer and first and foremost give you praise and thanks for answers to prayer. Lord, for the encouragement that we receive from your word and from the people in our life that come alongside us and and uh, Lord, we're never alone because you promised you would always be with us. But Lord, we're glad that we have the family of God, the body of Christ, our brothers and sisters in, in the Lord that we serve alongside. And, and Lord, we, uh, we go through the trials and tribulations of life, but we also experience the joys and the, the times of, that bring great pleasure and purpose and meaning to our lives and we're so thankful today our hearts are full of praise and thanksgiving to you O lord and we know that uh, you are the great physician you are the great encourager you're the good shepherd who you know about each one of the sheep today and so we put our faith and trust in you as we call on the name of the lord and intercede for one another and we're glad lord that we can pray for Stephen and Jubilee and the little baby boy today, Lord, thank you for what you have done, what you are doing right now and how you're providing and how you're leading. We thank you, dear Lord, and we pray for this family today that you will bless them and encourage them this day. And Lord, we, uh, we look at our prayer list today. We, we pray especially for Brenda and her family, her dear mother, Rita, and uh, Lord, all that they are having to take care of in the passing of Brenda's father, would you continue to comfort them, O oh Lord, and, and provide for them. Thank you for your peace and knowing that this dear man is no longer suffering. He is with you, O oh Lord, and we're glad that we can uh, uh, affirm that whenever one of the, the saints of the Lord uh, crosses over to the other side. We have peace in the midst of our grief, and we're glad for that. So we pray for this family. And Lord, as we look over the prayer list today, we pray for Pam's mom and sister today, and for Rick and Pam. Oh Lord, that you would be with them. Would you be with Jim and Heidi Ray and Camp and their family, Lord, during this time? And Continue to be with Ken, our brother, Philippa, Lord, and his family. And we think of Don and Nancy Haverkamp, who have had some difficult days physically. Would you touch this precious couple today as only you can and meet their needs? And Lord, we look to you as we think about each and every name on our prayer list. And, and uh, Lord, uh, our extended family members and friends and those that are serving you uh, in the uh, armed forces and those that are those that are serving in areas of the world today and in service as missionaries in the mission work of your church we're glad that we can be participants in the great work of the lord and and uh, thank you dear lord that we can pray for our sponsored children and 
and send dollars to help in education and encouragement and blessing. Lord, continue to use your people as we step back today and look at how you are blessing and helping us. We, our hearts are full today, full of praise and adoration to you, O oh Lord. Thank you that we can pray one for another. And Lord, we pray um, as we are experiencing a, a resurgence of the COVID virus, we pray in the strong name of Jesus for protection, for healing, for your grace to be sufficient. Lord, we, we know that we live in a broken, fallen world and we're not immune from all of these things that happen. And this disease has been with us for some time now. But we know, Lord, our hope is in you. Our trust is in you, O oh Lord. But we also pray for the servants that are on the front lines, those that are working in hospitals and nursing homes and those that are caring for people who are very, very sick. Lord, would you give them grace and strength and power and wisdom as only you can, O oh Lord. And Lord, we know that all the kids are going back to school here this week. And so we pray for our schools. We pray for our teachers and administrators. And Lord, we pray for families that are, that are struggling with uh, so many different things. And this virus and then all the things that are going on in our world. Oh God, would you come and help our families today and people all across Avon Park and all across the world today as they look to you for their family needs. And Lord, would you be the great provider and remind them that you are with them. Thank you, Lord, for yesterday, our super summer Saturday number two. And thank you, Lord, for the families that we connected with and the opportunities that you gave us and thank you for the backpacks and Lord thank you for hot dogs and chips and and just being able to smile and show the love of Jesus. Lord that's what we do that's who we are and uh, so we do continue to pray for uh, the ministry to this community, O oh Lord, through our brother and sister Jorge and Evelyn and all the servants of the Lord that are helping us in these challenging days in which we live. We realize, Lord, that we need you more than ever. And so when we sang and prayed today, Lord, we need thee every hour. That is the deep prayer of our heart. But it's not just a prayer of desperation. It's a prayer of hope. It's a prayer that we mean and you give us peace and you remind us that you are with us. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your good word and your promises that flood our souls. So if there's somebody here that's discouraged today, I pray you lift them up and remind them that you love them and that you are with them. And Lord, we do pray for the least, the lost, the lonely, the left out that are all around us today. Would you help us, O Lord? We are your church. We are your people. We are called to mission. And you have helped us to see through your eyes. And you are using your hands and your feet and our hands and our feet and our eyes and our ears as instruments of your love and grace. So would you continue to use us, O oh Lord? Thank you for the powerful, powerful image of the potter and the clay. You are our potter today. We are your clay. Would you mold us and shape us into what you intended for us from the very foundation of the world? And uh, we thank you for that good work today. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Here 
find myself once more. My faults and frailties bring me here just like before with strong and loving hands the pressure is applied oft times i tremble as he puts me through the fire i'll trust the potter's hands he knows what's best for me he has a perfect plan these human eyes can't see How much I can take when I face the fire again, I'll trust the potter's hands. His hands work deep inside, and he makes no mistakes. Though it seems I'll crumble down And I can hardly stand the pain But into his own design He is molding me I know though my world spins all around I am in the potter's hands. I'll trust the potter's hands. He knows what's best for me. He has a perfect plan. These human eyes can't see. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks to all the team for helping us today, leading us in worship. And, and uh, the Lord is here today. Amen? Amen. I sense His presence, and um, I, um, I am ready to just open up the, the book of the Lord today. And let's just feast on Him today. Whatever your need is, whatever's going on in your world, in your heart, with your family, Let's let the word of the Lord help us today. Amen? Amen. We're in Jeremiah chapter 18 again, uh, part two of a four-part series on the, this uh, powerful, powerful image of the potter and the clay in the book of Jeremiah. 
I want to begin, uh, I'm going to read this text again. It's a great, great word, a great uh, image, great story, part of uh, the biblical record of the people of God. But I want to declare again today that these are the days of Jeremiah. I say that because I believe the word, um, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when you and I open the book of the Lord, there is a word for us today, just like it was a word for the people of God then, it is a word for us today. So when I read Jeremiah... And uh, all that's going on in Jeremiah's world, I can read now and the Word speaks to me and speaks to you and reminds us that uh, these are words for us today, where we live, for our world, for our times. So these are the days of Jeremiah and what that meant for the people of God then was God had a plan, God had a purpose he was doing everything to help his people find that. He made a covenant with them. He declared, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And we have in that great covenant the declaration of the omnipotence. He's all-powerful. Omniscience. He's all-knowing. Omnipresent. He's always present. Power of God. But we also have in that human responsibility, human freedom. And uh, we, as He created us, and as He created the people of God then, and today it's, it's still the same, we have the opportunity, and I know I'm preaching to people today who said yes to that call, yes to God's plan, yes to God's will. But we also know that people have the opportunity, they have the right, if we can say it that way, to say no to Him. And unfortunately, Jeremiah has a lot to say about how the people of God said no to the Lord. And the result was their ruin, their destruction, their end. But God always kept His part of the covenant. Aren't you glad for that? When I think of that this morning, when I think of the world in which you and I live, I have hope in my heart. So I read Jeremiah as the good news of God. Because even though people have the opportunity to say no to Him, I'm glad that people also have the opportunity to say yes to Him. And that gives me hope. I believe there's hope for this world because of that. And that's where you and I must hold tightly to today in our own lives as we think about the world in which we live and as we deal with all that is going on in our world today. So let me read, once again, Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 12. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying... Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord, Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I might speak concerning a nation, or concerning a kingdom, to uproot, to pull down, or destroy it. If, if that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Or at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. 
If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good for which I have promised to bless it. So now then speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning calamity against you and devising a plan against you. O oh, turn back each of you from his evil way and reform your ways and your deeds. But they will say, It's hopeless, for we are going to follow our own plans, and each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. Let me hold it up today. This is the word of the Lord. There are eight things in the process that a potter would go through in forming the clay into the beautiful vessel that he intended it to be. And I've watched over and over again, and if you get a chance, go and watch a real potter working at a potter's wheel with the clay. You'll see all of these. And so last week we dealt with two of them. It was, uh, first there was the process, what they called wedging. And wedging is where the potter had to cut into the clay in order to get inside the clay and get the air pockets out. Air pockets cause friction. And friction, if it's there, whenever the, the formation process continues and when you get toward the end, if you have air in the vessel, it's going to cause the vessel to blow up or to crumble. And you and I, when we're left to our own devices and to ourselves, we will have a tendency, if it happens, we will blow up, we will crumble, we will fall apart because we're full, and uh, may I say it this way, we're full of ourselves, and, um, and therein lies the problem. And so wedging was God cut into, and we look at that as the work of the Holy Spirit cleansing us. Cleansing us of that old nature, that, that inclination as, uh, as uh, Martin Luther and other uh, theologians of days gone by would say we're curved in. The heart is curved in on itself and self is the essence of sin. Self is the expression of our sinfulness and to have it my way and to do it my, have my own will is at the heart of that. So the Holy Spirit has to cut into us. And He is the great heart surgeon, isn't He? Uh, think about the contemporary as the, during this time of Ezekiel. And what did Ezekiel say? And I, I have these words before me today. Ezekiel said, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So you see the surgeon. The Lord is the great surgeon and he knows that we need a new heart and he does that work. And so wedging is God's cutting, God's work of cleansing, God's word uh, going deep into our hearts and transforming us into what He intends for us to be. And we also said that the second one in the process was watering. you got to have water. The clay is dry. The clay can't be formed. And water represents the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Think about the water of life that, that God, God's Word and God's power, God's blessings brings life into us. And so, just like the human body cannot survive without water, we cannot survive without the water of God's Spirit refreshing us and, and helping in the molding and the shaping of the people that He intends for us to be. So you have wedging and watering. Today I want to look at two more. And uh, the outline is very simple. Number one, the messiness of the marred clay, the messiness of the marred clay. Now let's bring in Isaiah. Isaiah is a part of this exile period as well. And uh, you'll see the response that God's people had 
to the potter and the clay. And you see this over and replayed over and over again in the hearts of people. We have free will. We can choose to say no to God. And uh, here's where that leads. So Isaiah 29, 16 says, You turn things around. Shall the potter be considered equal with the clay? That what is made would say to its maker, He did not make me. Or what is formed say to him who formed it, He has no understanding. That word is a word of selfishness, pride, idolatry, all wrapped up in the words that and they're questioning the very existence of God, the very power of God, the creating power of God. And so Isaiah says a little later in chapter 45, verse 9, Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, What are you doing? Or the thing you are making, he has no hands. So whenever somebody says that, they're, they're questioning God and they're questioning that the hands of God that are all powerful are really not powerful at all. And so you see the downward spiral. Now that's true as a, as a potter works with the clay in the literal sense when the clay is not willing to, to go into the hands of the potter and the potter has control over that. Uh, we see powerful images where, this, and, and this is where the scripture comes out today. It says the, the, the clay in the potter's hand was spoiled or marred. In other words, it became useless. And so here is the, here is the wonderful, wonderful opportunity for allowing God to work. Now, I've watched some of these potters working their wheel, and when this happens, they're impatient. And they, uh, they, they don't waste time. They just take that piece of clay, and they throw it away and forget it forever. But in this story, and, if, uh, and, I, and there are 30 powerful images in Scripture where God is working with the pottery, and not one of them, praise the Lord, not one of them, does he throw away and say, I'm done with you, I'm through with you, I'm never going to try again. No, we see the long-suffering love of the Lord in the powerful image of the potter working the clay. And in verse 12, we also see how, what happens when we follow our own plans. They say, it's hopeless, we're going to follow our own plans. And each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. So to be marred, to be spoiled, means we're ruined, we're corrupted, we're perverted. And that's what sin does. Sin deforms us. But we see in this word some good news. You say, where is it at? All you see is the bad news. And I, I, I look at the book of Jeremiah, and there is a lot of gloom and doom in Jeremiah. If you're really discouraged today, I... I really don't recommend that you spend a lot of time in Jeremiah uh, because most of it is discouraging. Most of it is the people of God going against the very will of God doing their own thing. And we know in this case, uh, God let them do their thing. They went their way and it ended up being the end of the tribe of Judah and uh, they lost everything. They lost their land. They lost their temple. They lost their identity as the people of God. But even in the midst of that, there is, there is God's remnant. Those who were there, it's a small number. And let me remind you today in the world in which you and I live. And by the way, let me insert this before I go on. We know that um, the, 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 the message of the Lord, when we choose to do things our way, uh, the result is judgment. We see that. God is a God of judgment. God cannot tolerate sin. God will deal with sin, and He did. And He, he always has dealt with sin in the, the right way. God is holy. God is right. God, God is, there is no other. And so we have to realize that God cannot tolerate sin, but... Sin deforms, and, and the images here is that, there are three of them, 
And they're repeated over and over again in Jeremiah to uproot, to pull down, and to destroy. Three of them now, notice that. But later on, if the people turn to me, if they say yes to me instead of no, I will build up and plant. it. Now, let me just give you the numbers there. There are three negatives and only two positives. And as I read the book of Jeremiah, uh, sometimes I read and think it's not three against two. It's more than that. It seems like there's more than that. But guess what happens? It is the work of God. Even though you and I have the right, God created us with a free choice to choose Him or to reject Him. And yes, God will allow us to say no to Him. But aren't you glad today in the good news here and the good news that we hear over and over again in the Word of God, God does not take no easily. He does not take no easily. He's not willing to throw the clay and say, I'm done with you forever, but he holds on. He's willing that not any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The long-suffering love of the Lord is there. God is not going to take no for an answer easily. And it's stacked against us. Three things. Uproot, pull down, destroy. That's the judgment of God, but you also see the promises of God, the hope that God wants to build, He wants to plant. And when you think of something that is built, it is the the handy work of God. God is the great builder. When you think of something that's planted, God is the great farmer who knows exactly how things need to grow. He knows where the seeds need to go. He knows what needs to happen, and He provides all of that. There is great mystery in the scripture. I don't think our feeble minds can fathom all that is involved in the the great sovereignty of God and in our human responsibility. People have struggled forever trying to make sense of all of that. But when we read Jeremiah, and I'll declare it again, these are the days of Jeremiah. And it looks like we're, we're outnumbered. It looks like uprooting. It looks like pulling down. It looks like destroying. That's the image that we see, and I see that in good old United States of America today. The judgment of God coming down on America because they've turned their back on Him. And that's true not only for America, but any nation of the world. But I also hold on because of the cross Because of the resurrection, aren't you glad today that God's not afraid of our mess? The one who was the the eternal God of the universe, the scripture says, came in the form of flesh, the incarnation. He was willing to come all the way down, be born in a major, and live in a human body, and go through everything the scripture says that you and I go through, yet without sin. And he died on the cross and rose again on the third day. When I see that we're, it's stacked against us, yes, there is uprooting, there is pulling down, there is destroying that's going to happen because God will deal with sin. But aren't you glad there is building up and there is planting. And God is willing to do that if we surrender to him. Now, when I think of this, when I think of this, I'm reminded of the story, and it's a powerful story in Scripture with the the leper. And leprosy was a horrible thing. You were a social outcast. You were you were you were all alone. You had to be isolated from your family, from your friends. It was a terrible disease that just really just destroyed the human body. And Jesus passed by one day, and Jesus knew all about the leper. He, knew, he knows about each one of us. And the scripture gives us a powerful, powerful image, and the cry for mercy. God always hears that prayer. That's a prayer that we can count on today that he will be in tune with, and he will be ready to answer, Oh, Lord of God of Israel, have mercy on me. 
And the Lord just simply asked a question. And you see this in a number of the miracles because God wants us to enter into the, the miracle itself. He wants us to respond with the human response that we have, that we are willing, that we're willing to surrender our will, we're willing to give Him our mess, and He takes what is marred in, 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 the, in His hands, and instead of throwing it out, and notice the cry of the heart of the one that was so in desperate need. Lord, if you're willing. And what does Jesus say? If you're willing. Or it's almost like, why would you even ask that? Of course I'm willing. Be thou clean. And a transformation took place. One who was racked with the deformity of a disease now has been made whole. Well, praise the Lord. Why? Because he was willing. Even when we are unwilling, he's still willing. The scripture says God commended his love toward us, and yet while we were yet sinners, while we were still in sin, Christ died on the cross. He was willing. When we're not willing, he's still willing. And when we decide to do it our way and say no to him, he's not going to take that no easily. He's going to hang in there with the long-suffering love and the messiness of our lives. Aren't you glad God's not afraid of our mess? Sometimes we are afraid of people's messes and we don't get involved. We don't understand. We don't know how to identify. We're afraid of them. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. Well, God is not afraid of our messes. I'm glad that he's not afraid of my mess and your mess, and, and uh, he, he hung in there with us. And so the process, God's already cut into the clay. It's in his hands. The water of life is there, and now God takes that will. It is a will against will kind of a thing, but it's in the hands of the potter. That's a good place to be. Those are strong hands. God is all-powerful. We know that. But we also know that those are soft hands. When the Spirit begins to pour in the life of transformation. You know, sanctification. is it, The theologians define it as renewal of man in the image of God. And sanctification is real change. And if we're thinking about just a, a, a piece of clay on a potter's wheel and it makes into something. It, it, it's, it, you see the transformation there, but you only, you only see something that is changed and the, the appearance of that changed on the outside. Most of the pieces of pottery that you and I have, we only see the, the outside. And the outside is, is all that we see, but the work of the potter, God the potter, is the work on the inside. There's where the real transformation takes place. Sanctification is real change, real transformation. Now, we, we deal with a lot of change today in our world. There's changes all around us. Notice how it just comes and goes. It's only temporary. Change is only temporary. I, I, I think everybody here would say, oh, I just love change. It's just a wonderful thing. You know, no, we have a tendency to resist change. But if our hearts are left to ourselves, we'll also have a tendency to reject real change. This is what happened with God's people. They finally came to the place and they said, it's hopeless. We're going to do what we want to do. And that's the end of it. I, I look at that and I see, yes, the result of that decision led to judgment. But the, for the people of God, there were still that remnant, that small group of people that continued to say yes to the Lord. And the Lord took that small group of people. He still does that. Guess what? I, if you haven't figured it out yet, we have always been in the minority, the body of Christ, the church. 
and the world has stacked up against the church and kings and kingdoms have come and gone and they were bigger and they were stronger and they had more of everything that you could think of and those things have come and gone. Change is only temporary, but real change and transformation, God takes that small group of people and think about what he did with his church, that small band of believers and he turned the world upside down because they were full of the Holy Spirit and they were in the hands of the potter, and God shaped them and molded them, and he continues to do that. We're always going to be outnumbered. Jeremiah reminds us that we're outnumbered. Sin is going to have the best of us if, it's, if we're left to ourselves. But thank God there is the good news in these words that remind us. So, you remember when your mess, and you put that mess into the hands of the potter. And God began to do the work only he could do. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So that leads us to the second of the two today. The first one, God has to get us to that place where he gets us, we're in his hands. And, and when we're in his hands, it starts out and you look at the potter and it's wobbly. And God, God, God is the steady hand. And eventually centers it, and we get centered on the will of the Lord. And God, God begins to help us to stay focused, and, and, and we're zeroed in on what God's will and purpose and plan is, and that's a good thing. So we need that. God, God long-suffering love of God. Even when we still have the choice to say no to Him, God is, He is the holy hound from heaven. And prevenient grace is at work. You, you know somebody that's lost in sin today and you almost feel like giving up on them. Don't give up on them. Why? Because God hasn't given up on them yet. And you remember when it took you forever and God hung in there with you. And uh, look at where you're at today. Aren't you glad for the long-suffering love of the Lord? So the, the potter is the steady hands. They're strong hands. They're soft hands. We know that it's the work of the Holy Spirit transforming us, bringing real change to our hearts. But then think about the continuation of this. What does that mean? Well, the choice was there. It was marred in the hands of the potter. A human potter would just throw it aside and forget about it forever. But God, what does the scripture say here? The potter remade it. The word make and remade in the scripture is talking about creation. God's creating power. And God is always doing something new. Instead of throwing it aside and saying, I'm done with you forever, God takes it again. And the scripture says he reformed it. He remade it. And that is the work of creation, the recreating power of God. And when we think about our relationship with Him, God is the one who creates. And think about the, the plan of salvation and the purpose of salvation. He takes that which is old and turns it into something new. I read Alexander White, one of the great heroes of days gone past, and he says in the scriptures we see over and over again the God of new beginnings where he takes the old and what seemingly does not have any value or purpose, and he transforms it into what he intends for it to be. When one is surrendered to the will and purposes of God, we see that. So number two today, the pleasure of the potter's hand. Don't miss this word here. Don't miss it. Yes, it's marred in the hand of the potter, but the vessel he was making of the clay was spoiled or marred in the hand of the potter. So he remade it. There's the word creation. God is doing something new. And then listen to this line. This is the powerful line. As it pleased the potter to make. The pleasure of God. What does that word mean? That's one of the most powerful words you'll find in Scripture. That word means that God has purpose. God has a plan. God wants us to be complete and whole. And He has 
from the very foundation of the world a grand plan for you and me. And when he takes that and, and he's, 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 he has pleasure in that. Again, God's not afraid of our mess. I'm sure when it's all wobbling around, when it's fighting against the will upon all will and it's dry and formless in life, the temptation for any human being would say, just throw it away and forget about it. But God's steady hand holds on to it. And maybe, maybe some of the, 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 the words from Isaiah will help us again today. Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. Hear that first. You are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. There's the difference between just an ordinary, ordinary everyday potter. God is Father and God is potter. Now, what does any good father want to see in his children? He wants, to, he wants them to be the very best. He wants them to be complete and whole. When I think about my children, I want them to be whole. I want them to be complete. I want them to be healthy. I want them to have purpose and meaning in life. And the word pleasure means that God, He is our Father. And He is the potter. And when we're in His hands, He is smiling. He takes great pleasure because we're in His hands. And when we're in His hands, we're in a good place. And it brings pleasure, the very pleasure of God. I can almost see God in my own humanness. If I try to put the image in my mind, He's got us in His hands. And there is a great big smile on His face. The smile of God is the pleasure of God. He reformed it. He remade it. He didn't throw it away. He remade it as he seemed pleased. The very pleasure of God. Wow. So, when I think of those memory verses that flood my soul in these moments, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. There it is, the remaking, the pleasing plan of God. He wants us to be on the straight and narrow way. He wants us to be on the great highway of holiness. As we make our way through this journey, all around us we're going to be outnumbered. We're going to be the minority. But aren't you glad that greater is He that is in us? than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? And the promises keep coming and coming and coming. Don't look at me today. I don't want to look at you today and say, oh, we're just barely making it. We're not going to, we don't have this. We don't have that. We have everything. And God is taking the remnant. He always has his remnant. And so I read Jeremiah. Yes, there has been and there will be a great uprooting and a great pulling down, and a great destruction, judgment will come. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then after this, the judgment. Let's not take away anything. God, God is not going to tolerate sin, and He hasn't tolerated sin. That's why He sent Jesus to die on the cross, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the process now, yes, we're centered in His will, He's got us in his hands. And so the next part of the process is God begins. And you watch a potter do this. They begin to take their hands from the top all the way down and they open it up. And you see the beginnings of the formation of whatever the vessel that the potter is making. God knows how to start at the top of us and go all the way down, all the way through, getting us to where we need to be. The potter opens us up. What does that mean? It means that God wants us to be in a vessel that we are totally emptied of ourself and our sin so that he can fill us with his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, that we will be full of the Holy Spirit that we will be full of the very Word of God, that we will have everything inside of us ready for Him to take now and fill and use according to His grand plan. 
for it is God's good work in you, Paul says to the Philippians, both to will. Aren't you glad he's willing? <laughs> the question of the old boy, Lord, if you are willing, am I willing? Yes, I'm willing. Be thou clean and made whole. God is willing both to will, God's will, and to work, here it is, for his good pleasure. The potter has to get inside of us. And when he does that work inside of us, he shapes us and molds us. And eventually we're going to see what's the plan on the outside. But most of the work of pottery and most of the work of God in you and me is on the inside. Not everybody sees that. Even today, in you and your life and mine, God's doing an inside work in us. He is continuing to shape us and mold us and help us to be the people that He intends for us from the very foundation of the world. I, I'm glad today that God's just not making this up as He goes. And sometimes we, go, we do life on the fly. <laughs> we do ministry in the church sometimes on the fly. And uh, we, have to, we, have to, we have to, you know, just be ready for whatever's coming next. And sometimes things catch us off guard and we're not ready for that. And we, we get frustrated and we even get discouraged when things don't work out the way that we... But God's not that way. The steady hands... He's on the clay. Yes, it's a mess. God's not afraid of our mess. Hallelujah. When I think about the least, the lost, the lonely, the left out, out there in the world today, God is not afraid of their mess. We sometimes are because we, we, if we're not careful, we'll be inside in the church, loving one another and serving one another and caring for one another. And yes, that's what we do as the people of God. But when we come in contact with broken people, people that are messed up, people that are hurting, people that smell and they don't look right and they don't act right and they don't talk right, it makes us uncomfortable. There's something about it that we don't know. We don't know what to do with their mess. But that's not the case with God. He's not afraid of our mess. And you look at the life of Jesus over and over again. He got into more trouble with the Pharisees because he was not following the correctness of the letter of the law that, that um, you know, cro crossing every T and dotting every I as they saw it. But instead, he spent time with the least, the lost, the lonely, the left out because that's why he came. I did not come to call the righteous. But the sinners, but sinners unto repentance, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So these are the days of Jeremiah for you and me. In Avon Park, in the United States of America, these are the days of Jeremiah. No doubt about it. And yes, it's stacked against us. Let's quit whining and complaining and arguing about how bad the world is. It's supposed to be bad. How bad sinners are, they're supposed to be bad. It's time for us as the people of God to rise up and realize we may be a minority, but God is building, God is planting. Yes, ultimately there's going to be a great uprooting and a pulling down and destroying, but until that day we want to hold out all hope with the long-suffering love of Jesus and realize these are the days of Jeremiah and he gave us this powerful image of the potter and the clay to remind us that he's not finished he's got work to do and he gave us the promises in his in, in this good book and sometimes you got to look long and hard to find them but I know the plans I have for you Jeremiah 29 11 not to harm you but to prosper you to give you a future and a hope. And then in chapter 31, once again, they came and, and the questions were all around is whether it's going to, if this is the really the end and there's no more. And God says, I'm going to have a new covenant. And I'm going to write that covenant on your heart. I'm going to write it in your mind. It's going to be a new thing. And once again, he declared to his people, that small number of people that came back home after exile, 
His new beginnings. God is always doing something new. These are the days of Jeremiah. Judgment day is coming. These are the days of Jeremiah. There is hope. There is healing. There is blessing. There is promise in the name of Jesus. No wonder, no wonder Jeremiah's heart was broken over the sins of his people. But when they came to Jesus one day and he asked them, Who do men say that I am? And some said, well, some say you're Elijah. Or Jeremiah. Notice the text. Could have said Isaiah, could have said Ezekiel, could have said Daniel, could have said Malachi, could have said any number of them. They would all have been good choices. Some say you're like Jeremiah. Like Jeremiah. What does that mean? That means that the potter and the clay image reminds us of the long-suffering love of God. And yes, the potter knew very well about how messed up the clay was. He knew that it was fighting against, there's a will against will because there is that, that privilege, that opportunity, that, that which is in all of us to say no, 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 and they did say no. But there was also the hope of saying yes. So Jesus knew what it was like to be rejected. He knew what it was like to be hated. He and the disciples knew what it was like to be outnumbered. But hope, the hope of the glorious gospel of Christ in the hands of the potter. Only in the hands of the potter, the father potter of God, can we be shaped and molded into something new. And so our response today to God's word Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. God is at work today. And um, I believe that God is at work in this world today, even though we sometimes think otherwise. Sometimes we feel otherwise. Sometimes we feel hopeless and helpless and Sometimes the overwhelming problems of this world seems to say to us, there is no hope. I'm not ready to give up yet. God didn't give up on me. He didn't give up on you. As long as we have breath, as long as we're living in this world and we're, we're going about our life, and, and that's true for you and me and everybody on planet Earth today, there's still hope. These are the days of Jeremiah. If you're able to stand, let's stand and sing, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. The altar's always open for prayer if you want to talk to the Lord about what, whatever is going on in your life. But maybe you know some people who are a mess today, and you just want to come and pray that the Lord will work in their mess, and that He'll use you in that mess. That means you're going to get dirty and you're going to get, it's going to be messy and it's going to be hard. Maybe you need to pray for courage and boldness and wisdom to know how to reach people who are in a mess. I know that means that we're praying for sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and family and friends. May the Lord help us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. It is the work of the Spirit today.
every day this week I have prayed this simple chorus in my own heart and life, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. I trust we're all praying this in these days. The world is a mess, and there are a lot of messy people, and a lot of them are people that you and I love, and we're concerned. Our hearts are broken. Our hearts are heavy with the burdens of, of trying to reach them, and we know we feel that all around us today with all the stuff of this world going on that's so overwhelming today. And I've been in that place in my own journey in recent days where I just felt so overwhelmed and so hopeless and helpless. And then the Lord floods my soul again with promises like this good word from Jeremiah. And hope comes back. And I'm filled with hope. And I realize that, that God is working. And God has a, a heart that is a great big heart of long suffering and patience and I'm praying that the Lord will give that long suffering love to me as I as I minister and live and work in this world and so I've been praying that for us and so keep praying this prayer and keep keep your focus and your purpose on him and his word and his promises because we're outnumbered today no doubt about it, we're outnumbered today, but God is and always has been. He has His remnant, and we are the remnant of God. Thank you, Lord, today. Lord, thank you for the word of the Lord that is just as true today as it was in Jeremiah's day. So we do say these are the days of Jeremiah. Yes, we know that to be true as we think about the mess in this world and the mess of people's lives, but we also know it to be true as we think of the pleasure of God, the powerful, powerful work of God that's at work today. So, Lord, thank you today that we can um, hear this good word from you and let it speak to our hearts and transform us. We're in your hands today, Lord. You are the potter, we are the clay. Continue to mold us and make us into what you intended for us to be. And Lord, use us, as this prayer has reminded us, use us to reach people who are in a mess. Give us courage, give us boldness, give us, give us Lord, wisdom. And, and Lord, we, uh, we are totally dependent upon you today as we go forth in the name of the Lord. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.